Hello ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Memory Dump, the show where I essentially dump my thoughts on various gaming-related topics in hopes of generating discussion. My name is Jason, and I will be your host today as we discuss the role of imagination in gaming. Now, right from childhood, our imaginations are stimulated by all manner of media, you know, such as books, movies, and, uh, of course, what we talk about here, games. I like to think of everything as lying on a spectrum. Uh, I'm more of a, we'll say, a gray person, uh, very little, we'll say, strictly black and white. You know, on one end of the spectrum, you have media like movies, which is more of a passive experience that leaves very little to the imagination compared to other forms of media. Now, on the other end, you have experiences like books. Now, while a book might not give the reader any freedom to dictate the direction of the story, the reader needs to imagine what's going on. This often makes for a more, you know, personalized experience. You know, as everyone might imagine the same book in two completely different ways. You know, this could also be one of the reasons why many people often say that a book is better than the movie. The book, through their imagination, has been tailored more to their tastes. Now, games can rest anywhere on this spectrum. Heck, parts of games can lie on different parts of the spectrum. You know, visuals might be more primitive and really engage one's imagination, you know, trying to figure out what those little pixels mean or what it's, what it's trying to depict. What, you know, what does that little icon represent? You know, whereas the sound might be fully digitized and sound like the real thing. You know, someone might have just taken out a, a big boom mic and recorded swords clashing. Oh, that's not, although that's not typically how they do it, but you get the idea. Now, this is all fine and dandy. But who cares if uh, different games do different things with our imaginations? Well, for one, I do. I'm of the firm belief that if your imagination is engaged, then the game you're playing will resonate a lot more with you. Now, as anyone who's, you know, into tabletop RPGs can tell you, you know, there's no other experience like it. You know, tabletop RPGs are games completely driven by your and your friends' imaginations. Video games tell us stories as well, you know, and in some cases, like the tabletop games, uh, they provide us with a box of tools to craft and direct our own stories. Now, I'm not talking about some branching storyline with dialogue options. You know, I mean the internal narrative the player creates when given enough freedom. You know, some prime examples of what I'm talking about are, uh, let's say, like Minecraft and the Elder Scrolls series. Minecraft is a game without any real story, and yet is one of the most engaging modern games to not only play, but also watch others play. Now, I'm not really into Minecraft, but I know a lot, you know, a lot of other people <laughs> do. They enjoy it quite a bit. Um, I've had my bouts with games like Terraria and Starbound, and I find uh, both are the same sort of experience. You know, you're dropped into a world with its own laws and no real barrier to what you can do or where you can go. Now this is where the adventure begins. You, the player, dictate where you will go and what you will do. Do you decide to set up a quaint little home? Do you decide that scaling that mountain and seeing what you can see from the top would be fun? Do you, do you think that would just be great? Or you know, you, do you want to go ahead and explore? Or did you decide to go, you know, down? Did you decide to dig a hole and see what lied beneath the, the crust of the earth? Are there materials you're missing for something that you want to do? You know, it's not the game telling you what you need. These are things that you are seeking out for yourself. Now, this is the kind of storytelling I'm referring to. Even with a more guided experience like the Elder Scrolls, you're ultimately the one in charge. I remember spending hours in Morrowind on a quest that I had devised myself. Uh, well, actually, it turned out to be more of a series of quests with how long it took me. Uh, I wanted to create a piece of armor that had a constant effect enchantment on it. What did I have to do? I had to find an appropriate piece of armor that I could fit that enchantment on. I had to then go and find the spell I wanted on the armor, get the soul gem, not just any, I had to find a, a, a powerful enough soul gem, uh, which led me on an entirely on an, another quest, and then fill the soul gem with an appropriate soul. I ended up going on a journey all across the island, gathering up these different elements, and in the end, that feeling of accomplishment was just amazing. And I got a great story out of it. 
Now, I'm not going to go into the full details on that story right now because, you know, I feel that's a little out of the scope of this show. Uh, but the fact that the story has stuck with me all this time is a testament to the power of a player-driven story. Not just one where the player decides where the story will go, but when the player is writing the story themselves. When the player is using their own imagination to guide their way through the game. Now that's where the good stuff is. Now imagination does more than just help guide us through a world. It also affects how we perceive that world. Remember how I said uh, that it's a possibility that books may be more well remembered than, say, movies. Uh, because, you know, our minds tailor the story to the book to our likes. Well, the same goes for games. A lot of older games had extremely primitive graphics and sound, and yet the worlds were still absolutely engrossing. You know, all the way from the text descriptions of, say, the world of Zork, to the photorealistic graphics in Crisis or the Metro games, each game plays on our imaginations in different ways. Now, a personal favorite game of mine is Space Quest. I used to spend hours just walking around that world, wondering what was around every corner. Even after I'd figured out how to beat the game, I still went searching around to see if anything was hidden. My mind had filled in the gaps and what else I felt this game world might have in it, and I actively went and sought it out. Most of the time, I didn't find what I was looking for, but I did find other things that I would have never expected. Easter eggs and secrets and such. This wasn't a 1080p game. It was the, the resolution of the game, internal resolution, was actually 160 by 200. It was pixelated as heck. No, no amount of anti-aliasing could have ever helped it. You know, but the characters, the backgrounds, and even the little bleeps and bloops from the primitive sound capabilities of the time were so much more to me than just low-resolution graphics and some, some sine waves. As Roger Wilco traversed the surface of Corona, I imagined how it might look on a planet with a pink sky. I, I wondered how soft or hard the sand was under his feet. Was there any wind that blew up from the ground into his face? And was this the reason he kept his visor on his helmet on, you know? Could the visor even be removed? These were all questions I had and curiosities you know, I was able to dive into thanks to the parser system. Now, sure, I was going deeper than the developers intended and I didn't get much feedback on these little curiosities, but the fact remains that I was able to be so engaged that the simple image on the screen was just a springboard for that scene that played out in my head. Now, newer games uh, often use imagination, you know, with their graphics and sound as well. Uh, most notably, though, are horror games. Now, I know it's not the most liked game out there, but I absolutely love what Slender does for our imaginations. The very core of the game's mechanics revolve around not looking at the Slender Man. While the Slender Man, you know, may startle players by teleporting in front of them, you know, while accompanied by your typical jump scare soundbite, bang, you know, um, I find the fear in the game is not knowing exactly where old Slendy is. Uh, you constantly have this urge to look behind you to see if you're being followed, but looking at him is how you die. So this creates a scenario where your curiosity and your fear are in a constant struggle. Your imagination begins to run wild. You know, is he right behind you? Can you picture him just sneaking up on you? Uh, even when you die, you're left with the question, you know, what happened to me? Were you killed? What does the Slender Man do to you? You know, even though some of the gameplay was executed poorly, I find the game is a great example of what an overactive imagination can do to terrify you. You know, playing on the player's imagination is what I would argue is the bread and butter of video games. Sorry, horror games. Uh, video, video and horror games. <laughs> I find too many horror games focus on gore and shocking the players than really, you know, playing with their minds and letting the players terrify themselves. Think about it. Your favorite horror books slash movies slash games all probably have powerful atmospheres and just enough clues or hints to keep you on edge, wondering what's coming next. Uh, the monster in horror media often, you know, can't match up to the image our minds have hyped us up to to expect. In a lot of ways, I see this as not only an element of horror, but how we perceive video games as a whole. Now, how often have you heard someone tell a story of something they did in a game in some fantastic way, but then you saw the same thing in the actual game 
and it looked nothing really like how it was described to you. That person was engaged, and that scene was powered up more than any 15 gigahertz DDR9 supercalculator could have ever done. Now, thinking about the unpredictability of horror games, you know, I was brought up another thought about the difference between older games and newer games, and you know, and how they engage our imaginations. Now, I, I don't intend this to be a uh, bashing session for new games. It's just that most of the examples I can find of good imagination stimulation can be found in in older games. You know, back when games were still in their infancy, and there weren't really any guidebooks to game design. Um, Heck, there was hardly any precedent to what would constitute a good game or what would make for interesting mechanics. Uh, developers had to experiment more to really develop games into the form of media they are today. You know, since there were no winning formulas for game design, the game design was less formulaic. This made for games that weren't predictable in their content. There wasn't a standard anyone was shooting for, so you as the player often found yourself not only exploring the world in the game, but exploring what kind of mechanics were even put there. Yes, this happens in modern games, uh, but not to the degree it happened back then. And, and also, to be fair, not all of uh, these decisions and mechanics back in the day were good ones. You know, but they serve their purpose for il illustrating my point. Uh, your imagination can be engaged not only by the media in the game, but by wondering what is even possible within the structure of the game. Now, I, I play, I've been playing games since, what, the Atari 2600, and I remember playing Super Mario Brothers for the first time on the uh, Nintendo Entertainment System, the NES. And that game blew me away. Just when I thought I understood the game, they would throw something else at me to make me completely question just how much I understood what was in that beautiful cartridge I was playing. Now, I could do an entire show just on how Super Mario Brothers was a revolutionary game, but... As I would be getting a little severely off topic, um, we'll just end by saying that Super Mario truly is an example of pushing mechanics forward and really making you wonder what's next. Now, regardless of how detailed they are, what kind of mechanics are in the game or what they're shooting for, I feel that any, um, I'll say non-competitive game, uh, should really strive to engage our imaginations to in essence take you know, some of the burden for those experiences off the developer and lay it on us, the player. No other type of media out there can create a uniquely crafted experience like games can, and developers need to take advantage of gaming's biggest pro, you know, the ability to be guided by the player. I mean, what other type of media can be enjoyed for hundreds of hours on end? You know, in some ways, games should be seen like toys instruments to direct our imaginations into tangible form. I'd like to thank you all uh, so much for listening to my little rant, and I'd like to hear what your thoughts are on the subject. Agree? Disagree? Anything to add? Um, I know I kept things a little bit general, but uh, hey, if you want to dive into something, please do. You know, you can hit me up on Twitter. Um, my handle there is at bluescreen underscore Jason. That's at uh, symbol B-L-U-S-C-R-E-E-N underscore J-A-S-O-N. Or, you know, you can just go ahead and leave a comment in the comment section below. And if you'd like to see more of this kind of content, uh, please be sure to like and subscribe. It lets me know that, you know, hey, people like this, I'll keep making it. So, tune in next time for when we'll talk about more gaming-related topics. And uh, until then, game on!